This is the Infatuation Podcast, a show where we aim to elevate and illuminate Asian culture and Asian creators. Today, we'll be speaking with Wilson and Stephanie. They are young entrepreneurs and health professionals, and they have figured out the personal finance game, if you will. They are involved with investing, getting rid of debt, setting goals, investing in real estate and hosting Airbnbs. They are really a power couple who just loves sharing what they've learned and passing it on to others. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode, and I hope that you're as inspired as I was talking with them. And as usual, thanks for listening. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different topics. Everything from getting rid of some professional school debt to maybe becoming a super host on Airbnb. So uh, let me go ahead and give you a little disclaimer that we are talking about these things, different financial topics, but we are discussing them for entertainment purposes only. Please uh, do your research out there before following any of our tips that you might hear on this podcast. Even if something works for you, that doesn't mean it's right for everyone. So uh, yeah, it's your money. Come on, people, do your research, make your own decisions. But uh, we're going to talk about some stuff today. It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's get to know our guests a little bit. Wilson and Stephanie are our guests today, and they are partners in every sense of the word. And I think congratulations are in order. I think uh, recently engaged. Is that true? Yep. Yes. <laughs> That's true. All Thank right. you. I, I didn't tell you. I'm an I'm a internet stalker, so <laughs> I, I find good. out different information. <laughs> He's <laughs> updated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That just Was that just in Singapore? Or where, where was that? Mm-hmm. that was yeah, in just in Singapore. So yeah. we, were, we were there for a wedding, um, and we went up to the top of the Marina Bay Sands, and he proposed there. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, Singapore is definitely on the list of places I, I like to go to. Yeah. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and start with Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie is an oncology nurse practitioner uh, by day, but in her spare time, she is a real estate investor and an Airbnb super host. Hey, Stephanie, how's it going? Hey, it's doing well. Thanks so much for having us on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, nice to meet you. Never met you before. Uh, you grew up in Southern Cal? Um, I did. So, well, I moved around quite a bit as a kid, um, but my primary, I guess, adult life was in Southern California. Mm-hmm. We like to dig into our guest past a little bit. So can you tell us a little bit about your family background? Or like, how did they get here? Why did they come here? Do you know anything about that? Um, so first of all, um, I'm a first generation Asian American. My parents immigrated from Hunan. China, and they came here for school. So they got their PhDs here, and they actually graduated as chemists. Uh-huh, Super fun. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also have an older sister, and she currently lives in New York City, works as a data analyst. I, I like to ask this to people who have kind of different careers than their parents. Like, was your family experience, did that affect your decisions at all growing up and what you wanted to be as a career or even current things that you're working on? Yeah, I mean, really great question as well. I mean, I think I've always grown up with my parents instilling those values of needing to work a really stable job, always Uh wanting to have that doctor in the family. And (laughs) naturally, because of that, I kind of gravitated gravitated towards that. Um, I also really enjoy working with people. So kind of just, you know, fell into healthcare, really ended up loving it as well. So it wasn't like it wasn't like a torturous decision for you, like against your will, you went into nursing. Luck, luckily, it wasn't. <laughs> okay, all right, and uh, yeah. So thanks so much for coming on tonight. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, my pleasure. And you might have guessed. Usually, when we have people in their twenties or thirties, most people figure out that one of them is a former student of mine. And tonight it is Wilson. Wilson, you had AP Bio with me. When are this is ten years over? Oh, yeah, I know the reunion yeah. like just passed. I'm like, did it really? <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah. So it's been over a decade since uh, we've seen each other. But uh, you are a informatics physician assistant by day and at night you do a bunch of other stuff. Like one thing you do is you like to coach young health professionals on how to get out of debt and how to, you know, uh, well, how would you say it? You get out of debt. I guess achieve or like just get them on the right path towards a financial, probably security first. And if they want to, they can do independence as well. Is this coming from your personal experience? Like when you were in health school, did you feel like, oh man, this debt is racking up or how did this come about? Yeah, I think for me, when I was in 
grad school, essentially, it's like I actually didn't think too much about money um, mm. growing up. All I knew was save and put money in the bank. And you know how Asians, we have money in like mattresses. So that's all I knew. And I figured, <laughs> you know, you get the job, your um, yeah. health care, pretty recession proof, pretty stable. Like we'll yeah, always yeah. have a job and then never thought too much about money, thought we would be OK. But then turns out like bad things can still happen if you're not really educated uh, about mm -hmm. money um, and not, not everyone looks out for you. Yeah. So for me, yeah. it's like there's a like there's a lot of debt, right? There's a lot of financial decisions that come up, especially uh, for grad students, because we delay we delay a lot of life decisions uh, by going to more schooling. And then when you come out, then you have to make all these decisions <laughs> immediately. Yeah, and it doesn't feel real, right? You're like, oh, hundred thousand dollars, oh, two hundred thousand dollars. You just keep taking out more loans or, or racking up bills, and mm -hmm. and everyone around you they normal they normalize it. So it's yeah. like, oh, what, what other choice? Like you work so hard to get in, you're not going to say, oh, it's a lot of money. I'm not going to do it. So yeah, yeah. you just got to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you start looking at those zeros on your loan statements or whatever. And does, is it pretty scary? Is it like one of those points you're like, this could take me 10, 20 years to pay off if you do the minimums, right? Yep. It doesn't become real till graduation. Till graduation <laughs> and then you start living and then you, you crunch the numbers. And it's like, I actually don't make as much or like the number I make doesn't actually bring me as far in life mm -hmm. that I would expect it to. And I'm sure it's just kind of like this huge weight on your shoulders if it, if you have a big debt. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the main thing that people don't talk about is compounding interest in the <laughs> oh. opposite. Way. In the other, in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're paying. If you pay the minimum, you're you're really not chipping away much. Yeah, at like all. it actually got bigger. You know, it's like what yeah. happened? <laughs> That's not good. That's not good. Hey, so same question for you. So, what's your origin story? Yeah, so also um, first generation, um, like Stephanie, uh, my parents were from uh, Guangzhou. So, you know, we're Cantonese speakers, she's Mandarin. So, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> we kind of understand kind of each of those languages now. But mm -hmm. uh, my parents, I think, immigrated here in their, I think, I want to say 20s. Mm -hmm. 20s, uh, mom uh, was stay-at-home mom, took care of me until middle school, and then dad was a waiter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, brother, also in your AP bio class. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's up in Irvine now, or down, I guess down in Irvine. He always corrects me there. Down in Irvine, and he's a software engineer. And yeah, we we, yeah. we have been born and raised in San Francisco, and we've been here, been here quite a while. I was talking to um, so I I know that you know Kevin Liang as well. So we were talking to Kevin the other day, well, months ago on the podcast, and he was just baffled how you can survive in San Francisco off a of minimum wage or you know like twenty bucks an hour. Like how mm -hmm. he he still can't figure out how his parents did it. Do you, do you ever have that with your parents? Like you were a waiter. Like how do we eat? How do we have a roof over our head? No, abs I think that's one big thing that stuck with me. It's just like the resourcefulness. I think like I yeah. I mean I was we were I think we we were thinking about like. We always think about this as we as we get older. It's true. It's like as you get older, you don't really understand your parents till like you start going through uh -huh, <laughs> things as uh -huh. you go through life, and we're like, "How the heck did you figure that out?" Like the resources yeah. here, like now, that we have now, are so different compared to before. Like internet yeah. didn't exist, so then mm -hmm. the only people you could talk right. to was within proximity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they still like you know. I like to think we turned out okay, and it was yeah, just, but it was yeah. like man, they went through so much. Yeah, with language barriers mm -hmm. and then just giving up everything to come here. It's I pretty, know. It's pretty amazing. So, so does that fuel you a little bit as you do you know, what you do now? Is it kind of give you a fire underneath you? No, it, it really does. I think mm -hmm. part of part of the big reason we work so hard, um, honestly, is so we can spend more time with family. To be honest, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, we everyone works so hard now. I mean, which we should, but then I think a lot of the time it's like we don't actually we don't actually spend. I think. When we're actually looking back, it's like when we're in our busiest during a professional life, we're like, we actually don't spend that much time with our parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're like, oh man, <laughs> that, that, we want that to change. And that's part of the big reason we're actually like, why, why we got so interested in money uh, or one of the driving reasons why we work so hard. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we are, uh, we're going to go back a little bit and I think you guys met in college. Is that right? So mm -hmm. yeah. in Southern Cal, uh, do you remember what was going through your mind where you just grinding with the school and thinking, okay, I want to get into professional school. I want to make a decent living. Or did the seeds of entrepreneurship or did any of this cross your mind or were you just thinking graduate, get a job? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like initially we were just thinking about graduating and, you know, going towards that W-2 hustle life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we really were aiming for that you know, six figure, stable job, working and pretty much being frugal. Um, I was honestly chasing her most. Of, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was just mainly chasing her most. Of that college. was your main goal. <laughs> and she was fending me off the whole time. So yeah. that was a big part too. <laughs> that was most of my memory in college. Oh, man. 
So yeah, because that's kind of what you hear, right? When you grow up, you know, I, I work with kids like you, Wilson, right? So there's that's what you hear growing up is just connect the dots, right? Go to good undergrad school, go to graduate school, get a job, make some money. Hmm. And and that's kind of like the typical that that you hear growing up. But then did did you start to think, oh, wow, there's there's other ways to do this or there's side things that we can do? When, when did those things kind of creep in your mind? I mean, I think that, well, you know, part of my uh, family history as well, I realized that both my parents, they always worked full time. So they didn't really spend a lot of time with us. Um, yeah. It was kind of like lonely growing up, just my mm -hmm. sister and I. Um, so that was like a big factor into, you know, why we wanted to do something else outside of just working. Um, but it really wasn't until like our sophomore year when we were both like falling behind in classes when we realized like, hey, like, we really got to take things seriously. Yeah. So like, you know, finding that good job, I think is a really good first step. Like we don't regret where we are, like our W-2s. Like we say that, right? I mean, all entrepreneurs say, we actually love our W-2s. Like we think yeah. it's great. But then I think a uh, big thing is with W-2s, you trade a lot of your time for money. And then it's not until we learn that there's also other ways to make money. You know, they call it passive, right? More, nothing really is passive in life, but like it's it's less, right? Like if uh, if you're able to do that, it actually frees up a little bit more time. And that, that mm -hmm. concept was really, really interesting to us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, so you're you're getting out of school and you're graduating, going to graduate school. Did you come out with a lot of debt yourselves, or or did you try to kind of mitigate that as best you could going through professional school? Yeah, um, I mean, so for grad school, um, in nursing school, I had the op well, my parents helped me through undergraduate school. Luckily, thank you, um, parents. I know, thank you so much. <laughs> but for graduate school specifically, um, I purposefully actually worked full time while I was in the school as well. Oh, wow. So I actually worked during nights. Full time. She worked full time as a nurse oh, while wow. in grad school. Um, and yeah, went to school during the day, did rotations during the day. So that was kind of like my motivation and my hustle um, to try to pay off my loans and take out less loans. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, uh, I applied because like both of us would have had like six figures in student loan debt, probably around like 150, 150 each, I think. Um, for me, I applied to like every scholarship because like that's it helped me in undergrad, just applying to everything. Uh, in grad school, I'm like, it's, I know it's possible. I applied to like over 100 and I got accepted into two of them, but those two paid for everything. Oh, wow. So, so okay. it's so counted. Right? It's actually like the last two. <laughs> yeah. So it was worth it, but it was like there had to be ways. Um, I also worked throughout uh, grad school, but, you know, it's a. Uh, not, not, as, not, not as, as much as you. Not as not as much as you. Yeah, you, I was I was a study hall monitor. Like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> during PA school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so you guys looked around at your friends and looked around at your colleagues and and when did the idea of coaching people through their debt? Where did that idea come from, Wilson? Man, I think where it was is I think taking a step back was I didn't really dive deeper into my finances till like my uh, my family asked me you know, when, I, when I was in freaking grad school, like, hey, <laughs> we don't understand this retirement thing. Uh -huh. Like, can you help us figure it out? I'm like, I'm trying to pass my boards, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, what actually really frustrated me is I actually didn't even know where to start. That was actually, the, like, I actually never been asked something where I actually didn't even understand. Like, I didn't even know how to approach it. So that really yeah. frustrated me. And so I like, deep dived into finances, understanding just like from basic personal finance all the way to things like more advanced things like retirement. And then when I figured it out, I'm like, I wanted to teach everybody, right? Uh -huh. I want to tell everybody because like, you know, actually, once you understand the basics of it, it's it's not too bad. It's the numbers. Yeah. But um, with a lot of our colleagues, they have loans. So when you have loans, you don't want to think about anything else. Like you yeah. can't even think into the future if you have student loan debt. So that's why I actually, even though I didn't have debt myself, I I'm probably like super, unfortunately, it's, like a, it's a special ability is I actually understand loans really well. Um, all the different ways to pay them off, all the different types. It's actually super complicated. Biden's making it easier. <laughs> but um, that's why I became so passionate about it. Because once you clear that out, I say like student loans is most graduate students introduction to finances. That's yeah, the first yeah. reality where it's yeah, like, oh, yeah. shoot, this okay. is how money works. Um, and for me, that's, once I clear that for them, then they're able to think about other things. So that's become yeah. a big obstacle for me. And then that's why I'm like, I always tackle loans first if they have it. Yeah. And so you, you do coaching cohorts. Uh, what, what is that like? Describe that for me. Yeah. So coaching cohorts, I used to, um, so what I used to do is I used to like give lectures. Um, like, so I, so I become a, I became a professor after gradu graduating and they said, Hey, what's one thing you want to implement for our program? You know, um, that, that you didn't have, I'm like, you guys got to talk about finance. <laughs> before graduation uh, yeah. so i started doing that um you know so right at before the professional the school you were you were doing 
lecturing on finances. lectures on yeah on loans personal finance things like that just yeah, because yeah. like i wish we had that they had someone come and i was like i held my tongue i'm like you guys were not good <laughs> like they don't understand our situation which i don't blame them right they come here they just do their thing but it, it's different when you're experiencing it mm -hmm. so um i i was doing that for a couple years and a lot of people actually wanted more one-on-one -on -one support um, so I was like, you know what, I think this might be a thing. And it, actually I did it for free for two years, just helping <laughs> people. And then eventually I'm like, I don't have the bandwidth yeah, yeah. for it. Um, but now essentially I work with kind of cohorts. So about 15 people at a time, mainly working with healthcare professionals, just helping them navigate through uh, their finances, like uh, preferably after, immediately after graduation, because that's probably the most important time to kind of figure things out. And so people find you, how do they find you? They find you on your Instagram or how do they sign up for this? Yeah, they find me on my um, Instagram or a lot of it's been organic. Yeah, because like once friend you, of a friend. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think the, the goal I have is if I just do good work for one person, mm -hmm. like naturally they will tell somebody else. And, you know, because for me, like we have normal, like we have other jobs. So yeah. for me, it's like I'm not trying to push it, you know, like, you know, but that's I mean, that's something always as entrepreneurs, you want to balance everything. Sure. But um, yeah, no, it's just it's always been about giving back. So I, I haven't really thought too much about the money expanding, but you know, I, I think we found a, a solution to a problem that exists. Um, mm -hmm. And I think naturally people will come. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you just said you, you guys are filled up or you got a full <laughs> yeah. cohort taking wait list now. So if folks want to follow you or, or learn more about this, they can go to your Instagram, which is at Wilson underscore invest. I'll put that in the show notes. So yeah, it's really cool that you're doing that, you know, cause I think, like you said, a lot of people don't think about this and then they come out and then they realize, man, I, I don't think I can get married right now or I don't yeah. think I can buy a house right now. Absolutely. Especially in the <laughs> in California. Oh, my God. I'm Bay oh, Area. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, it's really cool that you're doing that. Anyone out there? Do you only do professional school graduates or are you doing – would you do anyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I The way I advertise it is mainly to PAs and it. it's weird because like – in reality, finances is universal. The stuff sure. I teach applies to anybody, but then people like their own little tribes. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Like nurses like to teach nurses, doctors like to teach doctors. But in reality, <laughs> anybody can come to me. I think I'm working mm -hmm. with a pharmacist. I worked with a couple of people who work in tech because the concepts are similar. But, of course, yeah. but yeah, technically anybody can come and I'm happy to help. Yeah. All right. Cool. So Wilson, we know you don't have time to go into everything you cover in your coaching cohort. But uh, what, what would you give us in a nutshell or an elevator pitch for someone who's coming out six figure debt? They're like 24 years old. What, what would you tell them? Ooh, well, that's a good one, actually. So I think when it I guess when it comes to I think the way I think about it, it's like there's debt and like building wealth. So the two things I, I like to think about, like for debt in the beginning is there's two types, like not all debt is bad, right? Well, growing up, I learned that all debt is bad, like all debt is bad. And that's like, it's helped because I'm very debt averse, right? So I'm afraid of it taking any, like owing other people money. Sure. Um, and I say the for 20 year olds, the two biggest forms of debt uh, come from credit cards, right? So the interest rates are horrible in those things, right? 18 to 20% on average and student loans for graduate students is about six to 7%, yeah. right? So um, for a lot of people, they say, oh, what's the best way to like become wealthy, get on the right path? It's actually finding ways to knock down the debt first. Cause I, I call it like bad debt uh, wealth killers. Yeah. Right? Like you can invest all you want, you can make as much money, but if you can't keep up with your bad debt, like you'll never become wealthy. So it's always like, you got to start with that first. Yeah. Makes um, sense. And then in terms of just like other things to think about, I think people's financial decisions become naturally better when they align, I guess, their, their, their money decisions with um, their core values and like their goals. I think most of the time when people make bad decisions, it's just because they just they just spend and they don't think about it. Mm -hmm. But if they actually had someone sit them down, ask them, what is it that you wanted in life? What is it that you wanted to achieve? And then we try to reverse engineer it. It's a lot different because I say most of the time when people make bad money decisions, it's not because like they're they're like they're not like they're just horrible with money. It's just they never had the time to sit down and think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's also a lack of education because I, I say most people, most humans are really smart. You, if you show them something like, if, like explain it to them well, like money, it, it's a lot of it's objective. So if you explain it to them well, you're able to align it with their goals. A lot of your decisions actually end up um, a lot, a lot better financially. Mm -hmm. So get out of debt. <laughs> That's the one bad yeah. debt, clear it. And the other ones is just when making money decisions, think a little bit about it and make sure like if I'm spending money or if I'm doing something with my money, is it aligned with a core value of mine? Right. And also, is it aligned with any of my goals? And if it is, you, you really can't go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's definitely something that you can learn. It's not, you know, it, it's not as hard as calculus, right? It's no. just basic arithmetic. We were ju- calculus is so, you're so good at calculus, though. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Yeah. I mean, you know, just to go off of that as well, I feel like a lot of money mistakes, per se, um, they come from lack of knowledge. So Lack of knowledge, yeah. 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 So one of the goals that you set for yourself was to have over a million dollars in assets by the time you're 30. Uh, when did you set that goal? Was that still an undergrad or did it a little later in life? Um, I think that was that was in around like 2018 when we were or when I started working as a nurse and we were still in grad school. Um, yeah. And we like first learned about like, you know, financial independence, personal yeah. finance, and we were calculating numbers. And yeah, and it was like, I don't know. I don't know why it's like become like mil- a million was so foreign. Or become a millionaire was so foreign. Like I always yeah. thought it was impossible. If you asked me before, it's like a big can you number. be <laughs> a million? I was like, it's impossible. But then if you actually calculate, like it's actually not like it'll take time depending on like your goals. But like most people can do it. It's actually not as hard as people think. Like, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's funny. We actually found out like we actually hit our goals when we were talking oh. to our attorney. Yeah, <laughs> we were we were going through like asset protection, and then he, you know, you have to send in your your statements and just like your your overall net worth. And he's like, "Oh, you guys are millionaires before thirty, like congrats!" And we're like, "Oh, <laughs> I guess we are, right?" Because for us, it was never about the number; it was more about just like making good decisions and making sure, once again aligning your goals with um your de- your money decisions, and naturally, just it'll, it'll happen. Yeah, it's not like you're going to change your whole life because of it. You're not going to go buy a Maserati <laughs> because you hit a number, right? It's yeah. Exactly. Like once you hit them, it's not like your life changes and like, oh, the world, you know, change. No, it's, it's like, yeah. <laughs> we were just like, oh. Like habits over time. Yeah, yeah. That lead yeah. to that. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it, you guys have matched that number, passed that number, and you're crushing it. You're doing really well. It looked like a, a multi, multi-strategy multi approach. Do you, do you have any kind of... I don't know if you, you can give one tip, but do you have one or two tips for, for folks that are a little younger and they, they look at that number and it looks really impossible? How would you encourage someone to kind of chip away and get at that goal? Yeah. I know, I'm Whatever sorry, I'm, ta- I'm talking a lot, but then because uh, I'm the finance person, so send me chime in for other parts. But uh, <laughs> this, um, I think you'll hear this from a lot of people um, who are who are millionaires or people who like who have pretty large net worths. And we all start, well, we have one thing in common is we're good savers. And, and like the word saving, it doesn't, it's not like sexy. It's like, oh, we're good savers, yeah. right? The, the phrase you always hear is you, you have to spend less than you earn. Right. Like almost everyone has that in common. Like the people who are the most wealthy have incredibly, not incredibly high savings rate, but like we always spend less than we earn. Yeah. And it, cause if you can't do that, you'll never become wealthy. You never. Yeah, you'll you're just, you'll just work forever. Mm-hmm. So that's like the one thing, if you're able to do that, that's half the battle, honestly. And then of course, from there, that's when you take the next steps in terms of learning how to invest it and make that money work for you. Exactly. Because well. like, what is it going to do for you, right? For, yeah. for me, it's like, okay, I save it. And then where does it go? Under my mattress, right? And so I was like, right. that doesn't do anything either. Inflation kills you. Do you have a, like when you say spend below your your income, do you have a number in mind? Like, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. You, a percentage or something like that? Yeah. I would say like if you're in your, let's say like, let's start like in your, if you're in your like 18 18 to early 20s, if you're saving like 15% of your income, that's like, that's solid, like yeah. of your gross income, right? If you're in your mid 20s to 30s, you want to aim for like 20, 20%, right? And then maybe 30, uh, 30s to like mid 30s, probably go for 25%, right? Yeah. And that's just because just getting in that habit um, mm-hmm. helps because eventually what, you, what you'll eventually learn to do with that is invest. You'll invest, you'll save up for emergencies, things like that. You'll save up for future things. But I think starting out, like, it's not like a crazy number, right? The only no, times doable. you want to do, yeah. it's very doable, right? Because then I would say, like, for example, for a lot of people I, I work with, you know, in their 30s, they graduate. And I say, hey, if you're able to save essentially 20 to 25% of your income and you do this consistently and you're able to invest that into like retirement, you can retire very comfortably at 60. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very comfortably. You'll be set. You'll be set. Right. And if guess what? If you want to, if you find that saving 20 isn't that bad bump that number up. You might be able to retire. Like you will be able to retire earlier. Yeah. It's not like a crazy number. Save 90%, yeah. live on rice and beans, right? <laughs> retire like that's when not, you're 38, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, that, that's an intense, I mean, yeah, that's very intense. intense, but it's not It's not yeah. for everybody. But, you know, right. at, at the minimum, everyone should be comfortable uh, in their 60s. That's the other yeah. thing, because we work yeah. with so many patients. We see mm-hmm. a lot of people who are still working beyond retirement age, and that, like, that's scary. Because they have to. <laughs> because they have to. And they'll tell you, I love yeah. my job. I'm like, well, you know, it's like the grain of salt, yeah. right? Because it's like, ah, uh, but it's, I know, it's, it's rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, even if you're only making 50000 if you can save 10% of that, 15% of that, you know, it's just something, right? You get in that habit, 
So when you do start making more and you do start getting bigger checks, it's just you know, the habit's already there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, what are your next goals? So you hit the million easily, <laughs> and now do you, do you have you made new goals, or you just kind of just just keep that million in mind in terms of like an out there goal, and just keep trying to reach and expand your goals out there, not necessarily setting a number to it. Um, I mean, I think that we have, I mean, we have a lot of different goals, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess some of the primary goals that we have is become multimillionaires by 35, um, both be part-time in our W2 jobs by the time we have kids. So around that time as well. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but I mean, you know, in reality, we wear a ton of different hats. Like, of course, you know, Wilson does investing. I do real estate as well, or we both do real estate. Um, we work as healthcare workers too. So we have goals within each of those avenues. Yeah. But I would say if you like looked at the central one, mm -hmm. uh, all of it, really all we're doing, why we, why we save, why we work so hard, why we invest, it's really just to buy back time. And that's yeah. a concept we really tell people. It's right. like, we, we don't do this to become like, we don't flaunt, you know, I wear like Costco clothes, every, you know what I mean? Like I wear the same <laughs> shirt, like I don't really care, but it's, you know, for us, like becoming wealthy, it's about having more time and options. And that's really, um, that, that really is our goal. Cause like we're working really hard now, but then we also have to recognize when to cut down on that stuff too, mm -hmm. when you've yeah. hit a certain point. Cause that's what the other thing you'll see is people who don't have like a, a good like goal, they'll just keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like they're already comfortable and they'll just keep working <laughs> their butts off. And it's like, you could have stopped like 20 years ago if you wanted to. So that's yeah. what we're really cognizant of. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's the one thing that kind of kept me into teaching all these years is the time, you know, cause I have summers off. I have a lot of holidays. Right. It was, you know, like, there's a, definitely more different ways or better ways to make money than more than teaching salary. Right. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it always appealed to me to have those summers off and have all those holidays and it yeah. lines up with my kids and stuff. So yeah, it's always I mean, felt worth it. I think that's really that's really great though we always we were actually talking about this the other day where yeah. you know we were comparing like oh yeah physicians you've probably like, heard this too you know <laughs> yeah physicians they make like you know hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars but then they work like 80 hours a week for like 52 weeks a year but yeah. then teachers yeah. <laughs> there was a study where they said like someone who started being a teacher and then go all the way to retirement right and then you have a physician from the moment they start education and go all the way to retirement and if you like took the amount they earned divided by the amount they work like a, a teacher makes more <laughs> which which is actually like for us i was like that makes a lot of sense it's like yeah. it's actually what's more important than like the money or like the time mm -hmm. yeah, right yeah. so I, I think actually we just we were just talking to another teacher where it's like my quality of life is great yeah but, yeah and, so yeah you know get out at 3 30 yeah exactly great. yeah Um, so yeah, so you, you're basically self-taught on all these things. Do, do you have a YouTube channel, books, blogs? Where, where did you learn most of your stuff from? I mean, Wilson's definitely a book guy. Yeah, I'm a book guy. <laughs> but I, I think one of the main books that we started with is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That yeah. was like a really good mindset book. It's almost every like quote unquote wealthy or, or like someone who's like financially independent. A lot of people start with this book because yeah. it helps with, it doesn't actually give you practical advice, but it helps change the way you look at money. It's funny. I actually read it because I was visiting her um, in grad school and she had that book in her bookshelf. I'm like, Rich, like that's interesting. And I pulled it, I pulled it out and just was reading it randomly waiting for her to finish like studying. And like, it just like from there, I couldn't unsee, yeah. I couldn't, un it's like the matrix for money essentially. Yeah. It's like, Oh, interesting. That's another way of looking at it. So that's one book we usually, that's the first book we usually recommend to people just to have them get another perspective of how money might work in the world. Yeah. Who's that? Robert Kiyosaki. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's been around 20, 25 years with mm -hmm. that book. And the title's great, right? The yeah, it's catching, I know. Great marketing. Yeah, you, my, um, so I, I don't know if you know this, my dad is a dentist, well, was a dentist and a uh, professor at UCSF. And oh. he fits that poor dad model. <laughs> he <laughs> he is the ultimate poor dad. But, you know, he come from a background where he had nothing. He grew up like True. in the Depression, yes. had yeah. nothing. And that's all he knew, you know, just work. We ne we never wanted anything. We we always had enough money and mm -hmm. comfortable life. But yeah, he just was the guy at W two. Yeah, you know, yeah, never yeah. invested. Just put it in savings or whatever CDs. And yes. Stuff like oh that. my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that. he fits that model. You know what? I I get a lot of it. I got a little bit of that myself too. You know, I'm just a worker. I just like to work. Yeah. But you know, it never hurts to to know more. And that book kind of, like you said, opens your mind a little bit. Like, oh wow, there's there's 
quote unquote passive ways to make money. There's there's more you can do with your money than put it in the CD. Mm-hmm. Exactly, or under the mattress, right? right, right. <laughs> we, we find a a combination of both dads is good. We would mm-hmm. say uh, yeah. a, good, a good hybrid. I think as of life with anything, right? Tilting to ex- to two extremes is not always is always usually wrong. So if you find a good in between, it's not bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the interesting thing about that book is that when I was a kid, I used to see that on the bookshelf and think like, oh. I'm not a dad. I don't need to read that book. <laughs> Which makes sense. <laughs> but yeah. um, the interesting thing is that like, it really only makes sense when you're like at a certain Age, time in yeah, your life, life um, mm-hmm. which is usually like, you know, you have your career established and you're just kind of like, <laughs> you're burnt out. All? Like, <laughs> you're burnt out. <laughs> is there something yeah. else with life? <laughs> um, so yeah. yeah. And probably the uh, another quick book is, um, sorry, all the books, right? It's A Millionaire Next Door. That was another right. really good book I liked. So essentially what they did was they, they did a survey of the, the millionaires in America and just dissected their life. Yeah. And, and, I, and I love how they did it. It's just essentially they had, hey, we have free food. You want to come here? We'll talk to you. We'll give you a gift card, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which, uh-huh. which makes sense because we like, would go to that. You know what I mean? So right. it, it's funny because like, you actually relate to, you'll, you'll find out. I mean, I'm not going to spoil it for the, the people listening, but it's, you'll be surprised who, who the real millionaires are in, in the mm-hmm. U.S. It's not who you think it might be. Yeah. Another book that I really like is um, Atomic Habits. Uh-huh. Um, it's one of those books that kind of, so, you know, on YouTube and like, on Instagram and stuff, you always see like people who are making big money and like, you know, super successful. And a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes over a lot of time. Um, So that's kind of like the concept behind the book where it's like building these mini habits every single day leads up to these larger successes. Yeah, that's a good universal. I think it's what 1% a day if you improve one percent a day, you actually improve three hundred sixty percent a year. Yeah. And I was like, that's, that's very true. <laughs> that's a big number. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's let's slide over to Stephanie's forte now a little bit more. Um, so another passion for both of you, but especially Stephanie, yeah, is real estate. And so, how did you get into real estate, Steph? Yeah, I mean, really great question. Um, so, well, initially, my parents they were always somewhat involved in real estate. So I mm-hmm. had that exposure to real estate initially, um, but they never really did it well, per se. <laughs> now that you look back. <laughs> yeah. look back. So they would buy a house and, you know, as long as they were kind of breaking even, they felt like it was a great really? investment for 30 years down the line when the mortgage is paid off. Yeah. Um, and that was how we initially got exposure to it. Um, about three years ago or so, we were actually looking into buying a primary home ourselves. Um, but that ended up falling through. Um, but we started networking with a ton of different people and we saw that not only were they doing like W2 jobs, but then they ended up being able to get like towards that financial freedom pretty through, quickly. yeah, pretty quickly through real estate. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of where we first were, you know, looked into it a little bit deeper. Yeah. Stephanie was the, one of the big reasons where, because for me, I'm like, for us, like getting a primary home, like you asked me what the definition of real estate was, I'd be like, it's a primary, it's a house you, you live, live in. in. But I'm, over like, your head. I'm like, <laughs> you can afford another home to rent to somebody else. It's like it blew, I didn't understand that concept. Um, so it actually took a lot of education from Steph and her telling mm-hmm. me like, no, it's possible. Here are these other people that do it. And I think mm-hmm. we could do it too. And that's how kind of how we, how we, at least she, she had a lot to convince me because I had, <laughs> real estate scared me. Yeah, yeah. But of course, Wilson being the numbers guy and the stocks guy, true, true. he was able to reverse engineer and kind of, you know, see that, hey, this is actually feasible. Yeah, she's like, I'm like, show me the numbers. And she showed them to me. I'm like, <laughs> actually, the numbers do add up. This is actually a good idea. So the returns yeah. are pretty good. <laughs> are you, are you, do you gravitate more towards rentals like apartments or what, what sorts of properties are you looking into? Yeah. Um, so we, we generally invest in three different types of properties. Um, so one is the small multifamilies. So examples of that would be like duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. So it's like a house with like two, like you could fit. Yeah. Like, how yeah one roof with like two units. You Two units, three units or four units. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the second one is um, single family homes. And we usually do like Airbnb and like short term rentals with those. And then lastly, we've been um, exploring more into the commercial residential, which is like the apartment complexes. And, and is this in the Bay Area or is this, this is elsewhere? Yeah. So if we were to try to do that in the Bay Area. <laughs> we would have stopped like very quickly. Cool. We would have stopped after like maybe one because it's so expensive it's so here. Expen- that's all the money. It's really hard. Yeah. 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 So, so we do primarily um, invest out of state. So primarily in Texas right now. Okay. Um, I think the main things that we really look for in the places that we invest is... Um, if it's landlord friendly, so yeah. 
you know, the tenant law is really important. Eviction laws are really important as well. Yeah. Um, and then also out of state tends to be better cost wise and affordability wise. Um, mm -hmm. So those are primary things that we look for. Numbers all tend to work better outside California. <laughs> yeah, especially San Francisco. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you do not want to be a landlord in San Francisco. <laughs> you do not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay. So how are you finding these properties? Are you just kind of keeping your eye on the websites or, or do you have agents in the, in the state helping you look? Yeah. I mean, in terms of agents, I think that really... Uh, developing your team and having those really good relationships that's uh, super important that's probably one of the, the first thing we tell people they're like oh mm -hmm. i just want to get into real estate and we say like the first thing you should do is actually like build your team first because mm -hmm. okay. like you're because you're you're you, they're over there and you're here and then yeah. you, you want to talk about like who the five or the, who the team members are yeah yeah, yeah. How, how do, who's on your team and <laughs> not names but you know like who, yeah, what kind know. Of roles? there's what frank roles no, i'm play? kidding <laughs> yeah. so i mean in terms of the team um the primary members are the lender so of course you know who's going to give you the money is that lender okay. it's super important to have good relations with them um the real estate agent um so of course they're the ones who know your market. They're the ones who bring you deals. Um, and the boots on the ground. <laughs> boots on the ground. Exactly. Yep. The boots on yeah. the ground. Um, and then we also have the Contractor. contractors. Um, yeah. So they're the ones who do all the renovations. You know, when you're going in there, after you get a house under contract, they're the ones who tell you like, oh, how much is going to cost to make this house basically livable and really nice. And then lastly is the property manager. So we don't manage all of our properties um independently um the property managers they're the ones who they you know answer all the calls they look for the tenants they do all that screening processes because they're familiar with all the rules there they're familiar with the eviction rules the tenant rules and all those that stuff out of state yeah, yeah. so like so once we like have the team and we have a pretty good system where like either the agent brings us um, a property or we'll find the property it takes us actually a couple minutes to punch in some numbers, make some phone calls, and then they're there, like, walking through and looking. Yeah, yeah. Which, pretty, which is crazy, because I used to think, like, oh, Steph, like, we, we have to be in person. Like, it has to be somewhere yeah. where I can drive. And she's like, even if you were there in person, what difference would you make? And I'm like, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just going to walk around and be like, oh, this room looks nice. You know, I'm like, that's very true. <laughs> so yeah, it, yeah. that 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 convinced me right away. She's like, if you if I flew you out to Texas, what, what value would you add being there in person? I'm like, actually, you're right. Like, I, I wouldn't add any value other than peace of mind, you know? Yeah. Do you, I would think that maybe the, the, the frugal person in you a little thinks, well, I could probably save a little money by doing this myself. Is that, is that generally a bad idea? This oh, kind we, of actually, we learned such a I mean, lesson that, from that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there, there's definitely two things that goes with that. Um, one, I feel like that's very natural in all of us where we're like, sure. oh, you know, like I don't want to pay $300 for this person to do it. I can do it myself. Um, but first of all, I mean, we've found that those professionals do the job. They're a really lot good at better. what they do. <laughs> There's really a reason good. why they do what they do. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot more efficiently. And then yeah. also, we also have learned to like value our own time too. So you kind sure. of like put a value on like, well, you know, if I'm making all this money and I spend this one hour, like it'll probably take us like five hours to do this task. And how much could you be earning somewhere else? Yeah, like like our rule of thumb is um, whatever like our normal pay, like hourly pay is. If we're doing work on our free time, it's like we're worth double. Like that hourly is double. So, yeah. for example, we were um, trying to set up string lights for our uh, our Airbnb, uh -huh. and we're like, "Oh yeah, we can figure it out." Like we ordered off Amazon, they got instructions, and we we were like an hour into it and like not even getting it started yet. It was like this is going to be a very long project, and then we're like, "This will probably take us like the whole day." And that's like, and then imagine in our free time, that's like both our incomes doubled. Yeah. And we're like, yeah. no, just, just hire someone instead. And they fix it. So that, that was a, that was a lesson. Also how hard, like how easy it was for them. It took them like <laughs> took three guys, like an hour and a half and it looked beautiful. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's the lesson we learned. It's like, it's sometimes it, it is worth it to spend, just to spend the money, buy back some of your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I did see you do some of your own work. Is that just more for fun and you just like doing it and like on your Texas property, I think the, oh. the Airbnb, I, I saw you doing some reno yourself. We did some of the light stuff. Yeah. So um, for the Texas property for the Airbnb, we actually self-manage that one. So we don't have a property manager for that one. Okay. Um, so we have software technology. Yes, but we use <laughs> uh -huh. technology for that. But setting uh -huh. it up, I mean, you did. She nicknamed me Wreck-It Ralph when uh -huh. we were on the trip because I actually broke <gasps> things more than i like was helpful so i just oh, I, thought it was, it, I thought it was intentional demo demo it was like you were just breaking stuff <laughs> no i was it was i tried to like build things and then it would be like backwards or i would break something so <laughs> i just was the box 
the cardboard box person, but okay, um, yeah. but we for the you're actually quite handy. Yeah, I, I think like for small things like hanging up pictures, hanging up TVs, um, putting together furniture, we were able to do that ourselves, um, and we actually had to do that for like tax purposes as well. Yeah, no, no, we we actually flew down there and uh-huh. then just like lived in the. Uh, that was rough. Yeah, <laughs> it was rough. It was funny because we were like eating cup noodles and like hot pockets <laughs> and hot pockets, and then the people would come, like our contractors, and cleaners, cleaners, and they're like. <laughs> Are these your hot pockets and cleaners? Like you bought this nice house, but you're eating hot pockets. I'm like, we can't leave the house because there's so much work to be done. But we did, we did to be honest, we did put in some work. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, it looks like fun. All right, so another fun side hustle, you guys, is your Airbnb. Uh, When did you get involved with that? Was this your first Airbnb, or had you done some of the single family residences as Airbnb before? Um, This was our first Airbnb. Yeah. So. The single fan work because we started with the the Long-term duplexes rentals. first. Yeah, we started duplexes first, and mm-hmm. then later pivoted towards uh, short term rentals. Yeah. So so was that something that you always just wanted to do, or you you heard that it's a good good kind of side hustle, or how did you get into Airbnb? I think for us the the number like based on kind of what our goals were um, at that point, it, it fit our portfolio well. Like the the numbers worked out essentially. We, we're like very numbers based. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so essentially. Um, we learned through our experiences that with long-term rentals, so these are these are the duplexes that we have and they have tenants over one year, the returns are like pretty, like they're good, but they're not gonna, you they're know. They're not gonna change your they're life. They're not gonna change your life and help you retire. They'll tomorrow. change your life eventually, but they'll take, they'll take a little while to work. Mm-hmm. So the reason why we pivoted to short-term rentals was because even though it takes a little bit more, actually a, a lot, lot of bit more effort, uh-huh. um, the, the returns, returns are, are a lot better. higher as well. Yeah. Okay. So that that makes sense. Like you might have a slimmer margin, correct, mm-hmm. on like the local stuff or the 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 residential stuff. But then the vacation stuff, you can yeah. charge a lot more per night. Oh, know? absolutely. Because right. and we go for uh, was it luxury? We go for luxury mm-hmm. vacation rentals, big families. So, uh, uh, but then it, with everything, right? It's high risk, high reward. So for us, it fit our situation, and we're like, you know, we can tolerate some of the downsides that come with it. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, it ended up working so far. Knock on wood, it's been working out pretty well. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And it is gorgeous. I took a look, took a little peek at it. Uh, Canyon Lake, Texas. Had you ever been to Canyon Lake before you you bought this property? <laughs> no, no, we actually haven't. Actually, the, the, oh, thing, the not before, yeah, not before. So the thing is, we actually bought our initial properties, and we didn't. We bought it sight unseen. Sight unseen. Um, uh-huh. We didn't see it until a year after owning it. Oh wow! <laughs> um, and Which then, proves the point. Like I would have added no value right being there in person. <laughs> it's just true. <laughs> And in terms of Canyon Lake, uh, we had just heard about it. I actually interviewed a ton of people, like cleaners, uh-huh. investors, residents of Texas. Because our agent uh-huh. kept telling us, hey, like, you know, our agent's fantastic. And yeah. he was like, you know, you should look into Canyon Lake. You know, I'm like, what is a Canyon Lake, you know? And it um, ended up being, like, a really cool place. Uh, it's between uh, San Antonio and Austin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of people go there, essentially, uh, to go on vacation. And when it's hot, it gets cr- so hot in Texas. And people uh-huh. tend to go there to cool off. And mm-hmm. turns out it's not a, ba- not a bad place to, to look into uh, investing in. So is it a kind of like staycation for those Austin and San Antonio folks? Like Absolutely. an hour and a half away exactly. or an hour away, yeah. And it's huge. It's five <laughs> bedrooms. It sleeps like at least 10 more, 10 or 16 people. It's amazing. Uh-huh. Who, so who's renting this? Are it family reunions or, you know, companies doing team building? Who rents this place? <laughs> Actually, a little bit of both. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we've had like birthday parties. We've had family reunions. We've actually had a company event as well and retreats. And a few in- inquiries for like weddings. micro weddings. About micro weddings. Oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the best part of it is the bus, right? Is- oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you want to talk about the... You got the mini bus in the backyard? How does yes. this work? Um, so with the property, um, it actually came with a... It was like a 1948 converted Great Greyhound house. bus. So it's, it's a freaking yeah. huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool. It, it acts as like a additional bedroom um but there's also like a mini kitchenette and also yeah. like a bathroom a shower <laughs> yeah the bathroom has a bidet <laughs> yeah. it's actually quite nice and i think like with airbnbs now like there's you probably heard like the markets are very saturated it's true a lot of people opened up airbnb short-term rentals and now kind of name of the game is like the you have to find ways to be very different and unique uh-huh. um mm-hmm. and for us i think yeah. we're very lucky that um this, I mean, that's the main reason we chose this property because we were flipping through and I'm like, oh, it's nice. Uh, and then the bus, I'm like, does the bus come with it? And then uh-huh. it, and it did. So we were like, okay, we're, we're going in. <laughs> yeah, fun though. Are you going to bring your family out there one of these days? 
Actually, we're we're going there in two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. We're bringing them there. Yeah. <laughs> My family's meeting there from both sides of the coast, like the East Coast, West Coast. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. It would be nice. Uh, what? So, in a nutshell, are, are there really great things about Airbnb hosting? Is there any downsides to Airbnb hosting? Definitely both pluses and <laughs> My, very yeah. big downsides too. Um, yeah. I would I would say that the biggest win and also the downside is the hospitality factor. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, how it's a positive is that, you know, you're really able to create that experience and that unique, you know, fun gathering space for families and really give them a place to build memories. Because like for our like duplexes and apartments, it's like, oh, it's for us, it's rewarding because they have a place to live, right? We're pro providing shelter. We, we, we're like, I like to think we're good landlords. So we fix everything. We're very responsive and like we're reasonable with our rents. Uh, versus when you go Airbnb, it's completely different. It's you're, you're not just letting giving them a place to live. You're like, they're creating good memories there. Yeah. So our goal is yeah. like when you leave there, you're like, I want to come back. We're like, wow, we were able to create really unique. We had a really unique unique experience. We had really, really good time. memories of friends, families, and that's that's what we strive for, and that is rewarding. But <laughs> you want to talk about the downsides? <laughs> I mean, that's it's kind of also a downside as well because every so often you'll you'll, you'll get the guest. Yeah, you'll have that guest who's like, oh, like there's. There's like one tissue that's outside the door. Yeah, um, so it's yeah. like things like that where we have to balance. Um, and also the, the stresses from being a homeowner. <laughs> yeah, the stresses of being a homeowner, like those unexpected events. We like had, We had the, an Arctic freeze. I mean, you've, uh, yeah. that was yeah, Texas. Yeah. So our uh, pipes froze and then they burst oh, with yeah. the guests there. And then we were like yeah. calling them. Yeah. And then we had a storm. But yeah, and sewage backup. And sewage backup. But it's like a stay. Yeah, like cash so, reserves and just be ready if you're if you know they're yeah if they're, you just make sure you have money saved for that stuff but for the most so. part it's been pretty rewarding for us so build a good team and have some cash <laughs> exactly, <laughs> oh, that's, exactly. Some, part, that's summed it up perfectly yeah <laughs> uh you ready for the lightning round Ooh. yeah <laughs> All right, this will be fun. Uh, do you have a favorite fictional book, movie, or show about finances? Um, <laughs> I think the first thing that really comes to mind is we, we really both like Crazy Rich Asians. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's not directly about finances, but it The shows word you, rich is in the title, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, exactly. but it shows you like what, it, what could be possible. Yeah, you yeah. know, because a lot of like it's not like they inherit. I mean, so, I mean, part of them probably inherit, yeah. but there's a lot of work that goes behind it, and like it, it's possible. So initially, sure. when we first watched, it was like a fun yay. You know, we're being represented, like Asians are being represented, and now we're like, actually, we understand like how they got there. So it's yeah, perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, and I think the the latter two books. There's two more books in the series. There's a little more on the finances. It's a Ooh. little more. Oh. On the inheritance and yeah, take if you if you want to read them or they're coming. I think they're coming out pretty With soon. The movies, <laughs> the second movie, yeah, yeah. So good choice. I was gonna say, have you ever seen the movie Trading Places? It's from the eighties. Oh. Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. Uh, and so there's this this rich these two rich guys at this firm, this investment firm, and they have this young guy who's kind of like the superstar of the firm, and he's a white guy. And then he says, I bet you a dollar that we could replace him with a, a dude on the street. It's Eddie Murphy. He's this basically homeless guy. I bet we could replace him with this guy and he'd do just as well. And it turns out he does do just as well. That is, it's on our bucket list because yeah. it's actually probably true, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not sure if you could take anyone off the street. But yeah, you could probably train someone with, you know, not as much college education or no college education. If, you, if they have the right training, they yeah, can probably do it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, add that to the list. That's a good one. Yes. All right. Question number two. Uh, what's something that you do that doesn't make sense financially, but you still like doing it? I should probably have <laughs> started this one. Start with that. I am. Um, I crack up every time I do this. So like, so I love Costco, right? I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> so I think for me, even though like, you know, we're financially okay, I'll still wait like 30 minutes to get like a $2 price match. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like some of those habits and then like, I feel great about it, but like, it's a total waste. Like it's, 
total waste. If you look at it, total waste of time, right? But like, I yeah. feel better about it. So I guess save two dollars. There's some habits. It's like I just bought this. And like, are you really gonna go on sale on me? And then like, anyways. But that's a. So yeah. my mom thinks it's hilarious. She, are you serious? And I'm like, no, go go shopping, mom. Like, I'm gonna wait until I get back my two dollars. So yeah, <laughs> doesn't yeah. make sense financially, but it makes me feel better. So yeah. But I, yeah. I mean, I I think also going off of Costco too, it's like we kind of Costco has turned into a lifestyle for us <laughs> where it's like we yeah, go there yeah. and basically anything goes into the, the cart. cart. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. well, it, yeah, I think there's something to that though. There's something about what's the saying? Like found money is more fun than earned money. <laughs> you know, like mm, that's true. Yeah. If you can get money for free, it just feels good. Even though you, you think about it. Yeah. You know, I, I can make 60 bucks an hour doing something else, but it's waiting in line for that $2 discount or whatever is worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh-huh. All right. So I know you guys like to travel. What's the next bucket list place that you want to travel to? So you got Singapore checked off. Yes. Yeah. So one of the places that we've really been wanting to travel is it's called the California Zephyr. And essentially it's a like an Amtrak train that goes mm-hmm. from San Francisco to Chicago. Oh, and wow. it essentially goes through all the like- Goes across really, the US yeah, yeah, it goes across the US through the states where it's like, and through the places where it's like un- uninhabited. So it's really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. So we're really looking forward to that. But unfortunately we can't go yet because we're self-managing the Airbnb and we need <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. So like you'll have Wi-Fi for parts of it and then you'll hit like the mountains and you're like, well, you're out of luck there. Yeah. Really? So you did research and found out you couldn't get Wi-Fi? <laughs> we're figuring out like, you uh-huh. know, how often, like where are the places with Wi-Fi or like yeah. we have data, but we're going to figure it, we're going to figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that sounds fun. You know, another one you might want to try, I haven't done it. I've only done one leg of it is the Canadian rail. Oh. It is actually supposed to be really good. So I took it from Quebec to Montreal, but you could take it all the way to BC. You could take it all the way to British Columbia. And I heard that Canadian rail is a little better than Amtrak. I don't know. I I, I can't speak to that, I, but I it's supposed to be it. really. <laughs> but yeah, you go through prairies, you go through mountains, mm. you go through a lot of stuff. I think you you know you get to see a lot of a lot of different terrains. So. She's adding okay. it to our bucket list. <laughs> so you're adding that. I mean, I mean, I I definitely agree. Canada is like beautiful. Yeah. I went to Banff before and it was like, oh, oh my yeah. god, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you get the whole whole continent. You go from one side to the other. It's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Hey, we like to end our episode by asking our guests to name an infatuation. Uh, an infatuation is anyone in the Asian community, living or deceased, that has inspired you. Could be someone you know or someone that has inspired you from afar. So you could each pick one or you can combine your answer. So Wilson and Stephanie, who is your infatuation? Um, I'd say that my infatuation is probably my parents. Yeah. Um, I think that They've worked from like living without electricity in the fields to uh-huh. coming here and building such a great life for us. Getting a PhD in chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and they've, even though they, they do things like untraditionally sometimes, but <laughs> we have learned a ton from them. Um, yeah. And they've learned a lot from not having internet. So, yeah. super thankful for that. And can you eat spicy food? Did you inherit the spicy food gene? I did, yes. <laughs> and it exists because I'm like, that's not a thing. And then I, I, not I, a went, cal- I went back. Kind of thing, yeah. yeah, and then I ate the food. I'm like, everything is, I swear the water is spicy. Like, yeah. everything is hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's no joke, man. They, <laughs> that's a chilly way of life over there. <laughs> that's for sure. So, uh, Wilson, you got one? Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to give you, I don't know how people shout you out, Mr. Chen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> for, uh, I was... No, I was just thinking, I mean, just really grateful to have met you. I think you're one of the big reasons why I actually uh, fell into the sciences. Oh, man, you're going to make me cry, Wilson. I know. I, I uh, <laughs> actually explored a lot of, uh, I tried to like try other things because I'm like, oh, just do what you do best uh, in college and major in that. And I tried everything. And it's like, I always naturally went back to the sciences because I, th- I thought you built such a good foundation. Uh, I remember I was telling Steph, like my first D, no, my first D plus was in your your first quarter. (laughs) And I, and I thought you handled that so well where you, because obviously I was crushed, right? I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to get in college. (laughs) I'm a failure. (laughs) I'm a failure, right? But I remember, um, probably still do this now where you, you have the talk with the class and you're like, hey, um, this, this happens, right? But it's not a reflection of who you are. It just shows you like how much, like there's work to be done and I'm here to support you. Right. I'm going to help you. Um, I have resources. You have <laughs> options. And if you work hard and you work with me, like the great will improve. So you oh, made man. me feel from like completely hopeless to like, hey, no, he's like, they're, they're here for me. 
and it's possible. So that that stuck out to me a lot. So, you know, because everyone does that. And mm -hmm. I became, a, you know, I'm a professor now, right? So t education, it's because of, of educators like you. So thank you, Mr. Chen. Oh, man. Hey, you're the first. You're the first to call me out, Wilson. So <laughs> going up on the Hall of Fame on the, on the podcast <laughs> wall here. <laughs> no, but thanks. You, no, you're a great student. You know, I, I, I live for students like you guys, you know, who are, you know, come from humble backgrounds and end up doing great things. So it's really, really satisfying. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, shout out to you too, Wilson. Congrats <laughs> on what you're doing and you too, Stephanie. Thanks so much for spending some time with me. I can't believe it's been an hour. It just went flying by. Yeah, that no, was yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for all your, your advice out there. People can find out more about Wilson and Stephanie on Instagram and then go to their bios and there's some other links that you can follow there. So it's at Wilson underscore invest. And for Stephanie, you can find her at Steph underscore estate. And so you can see what they're up to. There's even a link to the Airbnb in Texas. So <laughs> if you and 14 of your friends want to go to Canyon Lake, Texas, what time of the year is the best out there? Spring, fall, shoulder season? What are we doing? Probably spring and summer, but that's also the busiest time. <laughs> uh, okay. We'll take care of you no matter when. We'll take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm sure, I'm sure even in the winter, it's just cold, but I'm sure it's beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah. And so we have a hot tub. We have a hot tub. So. We got hot fire tub. pits. Uh, yeah. No, we, we, we're ready. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Everyone out there, you can write to us at infatuationpodcast at gmail.com and you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook at the infatuation podcast. Thank you for listening to us and do us a favor. Hey, uh, send this link to somebody that you think might be interested in this topic, uh, whether it be the fact that they're in huge debt. They can look at Wilson's uh, Instagram and find some advice, or maybe they're, you're interested in becoming an Airbnb host. You can look at Stephanie's website. So yes, forward this link to somebody so they hear this episode. That's our best form of advertisement. So on behalf of Stephanie Wilson and myself, we hope that you're all happy, healthy, and safe out there. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. Thank you.